But we're going to be in Mark chapter 14 this morning, verses 1 through 9. In the heading says, Jesus anointed at Bethany. It says, now the Passover and the festival of unleavened bread were only two days away. And the chief priests and the teachers of the law were scheming to arrest Jesus secretly and kill him. But not during the festival, they said, or people may riot. While he was in Bethany, reclining at the table in the home of Simon the leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume made of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. Some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, why waste this perfume? It could be sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor. And when they rebuked her harshly, leave her alone. Jesus said, why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, and you can help them at any time you want, but you will not always have me. She did what she could do. She poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare <coughs> for my burial. Truly I tell you, when, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Let us go to the Lord and pray this morning. Father, I thank you for your word this morning. Father, for your reminder as we're going to see, Lord, to do what we can, to do what we are able, Lord, that, that a small thing, even a small thing, Lord, to you is a beautiful, beautiful thing. Be with us this morning as we get into your word. Open our hearts, Lord, including mine. Father, help us to hear what it is you have for us. Help me to speak clearly and yet boldly, Lord. Thank you for this this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so this morning, it's going to seem a little bit like I repeat myself. But I do this for a reason because Jesus spent a lot of time on this, on what we've been talking about in the scriptures, and that tells me it's important that there's a lot he wants us to get out of the scriptures that he wants us to glean from this. And I'm sure we're only catching just a little bit of what can be gleaned from this. Now, we, we've looked at a lot over the last several weeks. We've looked at all these parables, all these teachings of Jesus from the day and the hour being unknown, the, the, the sheep and the goats, the, the parable of the tenants, the bags of gold, the, the ten virgins. There, there's so much. We even saw, if we go farther back, where Jesus predicted his death three times. We covered that here a little while ago. But as I said, we spent a lot of time on this. Why did Jesus spend so much time on these teachings? Why was it preserved for us in scriptures? Because it's important. Because there's a lot he intends for us to get out of it. There's a lot he intended for his disciples to get out of this. That's why there was so much time spent on it when he was with them. It's his last few days before his crucifixion, coming to the, the festival of Passover. There's so much going on here, and yet he's spending all this time teaching. His last teachings, he's spending so much time. And yet, as I said, we're just leaving a fraction of what there is to get out of this. And that's why I'm lingering. That's why, why, we, why I recap a little bit each week, because it is important. We learned in these studies that, that as followers of Christ, we're to be vigilant. That, that we are to be ready. Why? Because we're told in the scriptures that, that we know not the day or the hour of his return. So we must be ready at all times. The idea of being ready, we talked about this, that doesn't mean to be still. You've heard me say before, it means being active. You might say proactive. I liken it to coaching baseball or softball with our players. Those remaining still, thinking that that's how to be ready for the Lord. That, that makes me think of T-ball when you've got the kids out in the, the outfield sitting in the grass picking daisies. Saying, she loves me, she loves me not. Or the ones in the infield in the dirt making the little dirt piles to kick and watching the ball roll by. Those are the ones who are not really ready. Those are the ones who are being still. Now, we try to teach our kids, and Meredith taught me this because I'm not much of a baseball thing. When we started coaching together, we taught the kids what it was to be ready 
when they're on defense, when they're waiting for that batter to hit the ball, we talked about what it is to be ready. It's not just standing there hoping that the ball, because that's their normal stance. <laughs> it, it really is. It really is. The, that's their idea of being ready. While he hits the ball, we'll move. That's not being ready. We teach the kids that there's a stance they need to be in, that they need to be up on their toes, that they need to be moving, that they need to be looking. They need to be looking towards the guy on the base. Is he leading off? Is he moving? Do we need to move that way? Where's the batter's feet? Which way is the ball going to go? Where do I need to go when the ball is hit? If it doesn't come to me, who do I back up? There's so much going on that they have to know to be ready. They have to pay attention to. They have to move. They have to be ready to move. They have to know who to back up if the ball is hit. They're not just sitting there waiting, hoping that it will come to them so they can make a play. They are putting themselves in the best position to make a play. And that means moving. That means paying attention. That means being vigilant, being ready. That's what it is to be ready for the return of Christ. To know what the playbook says, what the Word of God says. To study it. That's important. And what's more important, we have to believe that it's going to work. That, that's key. Think about it. Again, I'll stick with sports for a little bit here. In sports, if you're running a play in football, if you don't believe that it's going to work when you do it, it's probably not going to work. No different in wrestling. When you go in for a shot, I don't, Dylan's not here this morning, but Troy's here, he's a wrestler. When you go in for a shot, if you don't believe that you can do it, that you can follow through with that shot, you're probably going to end up on your back. You have to believe that it's going to work. It's no different for us. If we don't believe that what we're doing is going to work, we've done the work of the enemy for him. We're laying down and saying, well, that's probably not going to work anyway, so I'm just going to give up. That doesn't work. It's no different in our lives as believers. If we are living our life for Christ half-heartedly and expecting to see God do great things, we're going to be waiting a while. If we are coming before Him in prayer, asking for great things, and yet are unwilling to submit every aspect of our lives to Him, unwilling to repent of those little secret sins that nobody else knows about but we know about, those ones that give just a, a fleeting moment of pleasure, that's why we keep doing them, and yet they pale in comparison to a relationship with Jesus Christ, to a deeper relationship with Christ. If that is how we were living, we're missing out. And we are certainly not ready. Rather, we're living in our own life. We're just, we're, we're kind of tunnel vision going along our own little way with, when we keep Jesus and our salvation in, in the peripheral vision, in the side mirrors, maybe even in the rear view. Just hoping that he'll still be there when the crisis comes. Again, that is not being ready. That is not being prepared for his return. We are called to believe that it'll work. To have faith in Christ that through his blood we have been saved. Our debts have been paid. That if we come before him in prayer, confessing and leaving our sins and our iniquities at his feet, knowing and believing that he heard us, asking God for intercession and, and, and instructions in our lives, knowing that in a time it will come. Like I mentioned earlier, having the faith of a child. Having children help me in my faith journey. Watching them pray as they're, they're five and six years old without a doubt in the world. And then we get old and we fill our heads with doubts. But watching them, seeing how we're supposed to come before, that helps. That is how we are to be ready. Believing that it'll work. And all the while going about our days and our nights, listening for the leading of the Holy Spirit and acting when we hear it. Being ready to obey when we hear that leading. Granted, He may not use you every day. Sometimes we get overwhelmed. Well, I didn't hear it today. He didn't use me for something today. That's why we're called to be ready. We don't know when the opportunity might come. Now, in the last few weeks, we've also learned that the Spirit will lead us if we ask and if we obey. That obedience is key. If we do, He will lead us in what we do and what we say. He will guide us 
in all aspects if we listen. The amount to which he uses is directly correlated with our obedience. And I can say this with certainty because I fit the bill as well. The bill, is, the bill that, that Christians today have not been terribly obedient. I'm no different. But that is something that can change. That's something in our lives that we have the power to change. We have that choice to make. Now some of you might be feeling this morning like, well, he hasn't given me much to be obedient with. Or, or how can he use me? I don't have anything. Or I don't have much. And what I have barely takes care of my family. Or, or you could be on the other side of the spectrum. Well, I've been blessed with more than I deserve, but am I supposed to give it all away? I mean, did he bless me with it? Am I not allowed to have some of it? Think about these questions. Because everybody, every one of us is in a different position this morning. Every single one of us. And there's a, keep that in mind and also a couple more thoughts here as we prepare to go through our scriptures from this morning. The first being never assume that you know someone's situation. That you know what they're able to spare, able to give away. Never make the assumption that well, giving should be easy for that person or this person. Or that some have nothing to give. I have learned that, that looks can be deceiving for many reasons. A couple of reasons. Because wealth, prosperity, significance is not measured in monetary gain or possessions or level of talent. Another, because not all of God's blessings are material things. Not all of his gifts are meant to be shared out in the public. But instead the Spirit may need you to share quietly. To give, to, to give in a meeting, to give your time over coffee, or to give discreetly, or perhaps anonymously. Sometimes he wants to use you, and he don't want nobody to know about it. Another, because we are not certain where we fit, or where others fit. Where we fit into God's plan. I say this in part because we all fall victim occasionally to the world. We succumb to peer pressures of those we surround ourselves with, and in doing so, become professional life makeup artists, covering up what we think others might see as defects or shortcomings. We, we cover them up, we cover ourselves up with these, these false facades that make us appear as if we're on top of the world, the king of the hill. All the while, we're, we're weeping inside, buried in our debts and our stresses and our worry, hoping that no one knows. That can go the exact opposite way, too. We can become hoarders of our worldly possessions so much that, that we keep them a secret. We keep our gifts a secret. We keep our money a secret. We keep our possessions and our time a secret. There are those who seek to make you think that they have nothing. Because if no one suspects that you have anything, then nothing will be expected and nothing will be asked of you. These facades, either at either end of the spectrum, can be convincing to you or I. We can fool one another. Sometimes we fool ourselves pretty well. But God knows. God knows our hearts. He knows the heart of each and every one in this room and each and every believer. We may not, but he does. And someday, we will all stand and give an account for our actions, no matter what end of the spectrum we're on. So knowing all this, I want to go through our scriptures this morning and keep in mind that this woman that anointed Jesus, Jesus knows her heart. He knows why she's coming and doing what she's going to do. And he knows the heart of those who are watching as well. And so we look this morning at the first three verses of chapter 14. It says, Now the Passover and festival of unleavened bread were only two days away. And the chief priests and the teachers of the law were scheming to arrest Jesus secretly and kill him. But not during the festival, they said. The people may riot. While he was in Bethany, reclining at the table in the home of Simon the leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar, a very expensive perfume, made of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured the perfume 
on his head. <coughs> so think for a minute where we are in the scriptures. What's coming in the next few days? What scene is about to take place? The crucifixion of Jesus Christ. He has warned of it. He knew that things had been set in motion. Yet in the beginning of the scriptures, we see that those who are after Jesus have in their mind that they're going to control this, that they have control over when they're going to get Jesus, that they're running the show. Little do they know, they do not. See, they want to arrest him and kill him, but not in this feast because there's too many people there who would, who would side with Jesus. But things were in motion. Things which included what this woman was about to do. Now it was uncommon. Think about it. She came in to the dinner. This was extremely uncommon. This didn't happen. This woman came in to their dinner. She interrupted their dinner where the men were gathered around the table. That in itself was uncommon. Even more for her to interact, to, to specifically go to one of them. Here she's pouring oil over his head and there's all these people there. But then again, as if you've noticed, as we've gone through the scriptures, as we've followed the life of Jesus, uncommon things happen around Jesus when he's involved. Uncommon to the world, uncommon things happen. But this is no different today if we are living out our faith. What we do, what we say, how we act is considered uncommon. So this woman comes in in the middle of dinner, unexpectedly. She breaks open this expensive jar of perfume and begins to pour it on Jesus' head. Now in the book of John, he refers to this woman as Mary of Bethany, which would be the brother of Lazarus, who, who the Pharisees also sought to kill along with Jesus. He was part of that plot too. They wanted to get rid of him because that's who Jesus raised from the dead. Because of Lazarus, all these Jews were converting, were believing in Jesus Christ. So that was a problem for them. So they're not a popular family either. So she was a follower of Jesus. She had heard many of his teachings. She might have not been sitting in that group of men before her, but she was on the outskirts. She heard what he said. They met in houses. They followed him. She heard what he told the disciples. But what made her think to do this now? What made her think to do this and why? Why now? Why oil? Jesus alludes to the reason in a little bit here. But let's look at the reaction of those in the room. Starting in verse 4. Some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor. And they rebuked her harshly. So she gathers the courage, just like any of us trying to do something, to step out of our comfort zone. She gathers the courage to do this, to interrupt this dinner, because she's feeling led to do this. And how do they treat her? You see, they were blinded by the value of what she possessed, what she used, rather than why she used it. They scolded her. Said, what a waste! You could have sold that. You fool, why would you do that? And here she's doing something for the Savior and she's getting reprimanded for it. They were scolding her because she went against the grain. Because they were thinking of money when they should have been thinking about worship and service. They were blinded by the monetary value of the perfume. By what they felt was superiority on their part and inferiority on hers. But Jesus knew the reason for her coming. Listen to what he says, and let's analyze it a little bit. He says, leave her alone, said Jesus. Why are you bothering her? Now, I don't know what tone he used. If I went back and looked at the original languages, it would probably tell me the, the root words and, 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 and what kind of mood a person would have been in to use that. I didn't go that far. But it was most likely a harsh root can't talk. A harsh rebuke of these disciples. You know, sometimes I wonder at times if he just wanted to slap them upside the head and say, what are you doing? Stop thinking like the world and think like me. 
Start following me. Start focusing on me. Start listening to the teachings that I've spent so much time on. After all, she realized the reality of the situation, the reality of what was coming, what was to happen to the Messiah. The reality that the Spirit was leading her to do this. And yet after all this time, they were still stuck to their worldly thoughts. They were still not grasping what was coming. He continues, he said, she has done a beautiful thing to me. A beautiful thing. It's hard for us to, to think about that because we don't pour oil on each other's heads and we don't anoint each other. And, but, it, but it was different then. A beautiful thing, he said. It's more about the act. It's not about what she was doing, but about why she did it. The simple yet bold act of obedience. An act of worship. An act of service. Think about this. I call it obedience. Why? Because why did she know to do this? Why did she know, why did she feel led to come in there and do this to Jesus? Did she know he was going to die in a few days? Did she know he would be buried? Had she figured it out? I don't know. But yet to get bold enough to come in there to do this, there's only one thing that could have led her to do this. The leading of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of the Lord wanted her to go in and do this. It was time. It was his will, and she was obedient. And he says here, even this small act of obedience, he says, what a beautiful thing you have done. It's no different for us. When we do just a small act of obedience, he says, what a beautiful thing you have done. It says here, if you look at verse 8, beginning of verse 8, he says, she did what she could. She poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare for my burial. An act of worship. An act of obedience. The Spirit acted her, prompted her to do this. And you know, much like us, when we feel prompted to do something, we might not know why. We might think, you know that? It's not my normal thing. It's not something I'm comfortable with. I don't know why you want me to do it. But I'll do it. She knew how she would be treated. She knew what it meant to go in there to interrupt them, and she did it anyways. Jesus tells those around him she did what she could, what she was able to do with what she had. She brought something that was of great value to her to use as worship of him. Now, she did what she could. Now think about that. She couldn't save him. She couldn't take death from him, nor could she offer any wisdom that might have helped him get out of the situation, not that he wanted to. She had faith to believe that he was who he said he was, that because of him, they would be saved to eternity. Think about it. She saw Lazarus raised from the dead. She had reason to believe that he's going to do what he says he's going to do. So when the Spirit prompted her, she listened. That is what he asks of you and I as followers of Jesus Christ, to do what we are able. That is something different for each of us. What you are able to, according to your faith, according to your ability. Don't get caught up in what others are going to think, what others are going to say, good or bad. Like I said, she knew what was going to come her way when she went in there. She knew what the volume, the volume, value of that perfume was. Listen to what the Spirit says and obey. And it might not be a big thing. I keep hyping. I don't want you to think you have to go out and start a crusade. It might be a cup of coffee with a friend. It might be sending a gift. It might be any number of things. It might simply be getting back to giving God what is His and not keeping it for ourselves. That is a place to start in our hearts, in our homes, in our families. We have to start there and branch out. I heard it said in a, in a message the other day, it said, if it don't work at home, don't take it out at home. We have to start at home. Giving every aspect of our lives to his leading. We have to challenge him in that. He asked us, we covered, that was another parable we looked at. 
we have to challenge him in that. He asks us to. There are those, look at the Pharisees. We give our 10%. 10% of everything goes to the Lord, and after that, we're good. But Jesus says, challenge me in this, and see if I will not open the floodgates of heaven. He's not talking just about your tithes. He's talking about your time, about everything he is giving you. Now, I'm not saying double everything you do. That might be a bad financial decision for 99% for of us. But start in ignorance. If he will open the floodgates, try to crack ours just a little bit and see what he will do. Challenge him in it. When you obey in those little, beautiful things, he will lead you to more and more. And, and what will the result be? Think about this. The Pharisees did it because they were getting something in return. Their pockets were getting a little full. But he says of Mary in the scriptures, Verse 9, truly I tell you, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, that what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Told throughout the world. Because out of faith and obedience, she did what she could. He didn't say she'll be rich beyond her wildest dreams. He didn't say she'll live like a queen or, or she'll never want for anything. No, she probably lived a very poor, a very plain, a very simple life. Probably a life in fear of being killed because she was related to Lazarus, because she followed Jesus Christ. And yet she did what she could, what she was able. And he says here, what she has done will be told throughout the world in memory of her because she had faith. Think about that. A little beautiful thing you do, a little small thing you do could lead a person to Jesus Christ. And every time they tell somebody, they might say, this person, this person did this little seemingly thing that didn't, didn't think mattered at the time, but it, it helped me find Christ. It helped me be saved. That's what she did. Now isn't that, isn't that accolade from Jesus Christ, isn't that being told worldwide with the gospel of Jesus Christ, isn't that better than any worldly possession, any worldly accolade or trophy that we can get? He asks us simply to do what we are able. Whatever that means for each of you, the Spirit knows what you are capable of. But think about this, the Spirit also knows with his help and his leading, you are capable of far more than any of us can imagine. We can only go so far on our own. But with him, so much more is possible. So let him lead you. Have the faith that the Spirit will not lead you astray, that you will, be, that you will do what you're able. It will only ask you to do what he knows you are able to do. It's all he asks of us to do what we can. Let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, we know, Lord, that the ability that you have placed in each one of us, Lord, for whatever it is, for whatever you have in mind for us, Lord, it's something different. Lord, that's something we have to come before you and we have to ask. What is it? We have to say, Lord, I'm ready. Show me what you want me to do. How big or how small? You might ask, Lord, start me with a small thing, please. But Father, we ask that you lead us this morning, each individually and as a church. Lead us to what your will is, to what you would have us do for your gospel, Lord. Lord, so that we may glorify you in the process, that the world may know that you are here more than ever, Lord that your spirit is within each of us. I thank you for this this morning. We praise you for this this morning and, and how I see you work in so many, Lord. I thank you for it. We praise you for it today as we prepare to sing. We do it in the glory of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen.